Hi everyone. This video is actually going to be a little bit different in that we don't have a whiteboard set up because this video is actually dedicated to how to get a five on the AP Physics 1 exam. So for context, I took the AP Physics 1 exam last year. I took the May 24th paper one just for clarification and I scored a five on it. And I think the reason why I got that five was because I did a ton of self-studying. I really pushed myself two months before the AP exam to study and get that five because I wanted that five so bad. And here's how I think you can get that five too, since the AP exam is going to be papered this year. So I think the number one tip to getting a five is again, practice, 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 practice. There is pre that is pretty much the number one best tip, best thing you can do. Find as many practice resources as you can just there just search the internet just scour through all of the archives find as many practice resources as you can and just do as many practice problems as possible so some examples i would say um i would rec definitely recommend the mit prep book for ap physics one the mit prep book has so many practice problems i think they're around 82 problems just for kinematics. So yeah, there's a lot. There's also some FRQs in the MIT workbook, and I would 100% recommend those because those FRQs are highly conceptual. And that brings me to my second one. I think in AP Physics 1, the only numbers that you really see most of the time on like certain questions, most of those numbers are just subscripts like v naught v1 i naught i1 stuff like that like most of it is qualitative reasoning in ap physics one so definitely try to think of physics more conceptually like okay v velocity we know that's delta x over delta t but what does that actually mean conceptually what does that mean qualitatively if the if an object were to accelerate if an object were to accelerate and its acceleration were perpendicular to its velocity, what would that mean? That would mean, it, it, obviously you know that's in circular motion, but that's a really fundamental example. So other ones I can think of, it's like, what if something doubles? What if some quantity doubles? How does that affect other quantities? And that's actually, uh, the, that's actually the entire basis of one FRQ, which I will get to. But yeah, that is qualitative reasoning versus quantitative reasoning. You'll need to definitely brush up on qualitative reasoning before you can even try for a five on the AP exam. Definitely get that qualitative reasoning down. But I will say there is a little bit of quantitative reasoning involved, but that quantitative reasoning doesn't have a lot to do with numbers, more so variables. And that brings me to my third tip, derive your own formulas. I can think of an example on my last on my, on my AP exam that involved the use of the impulse momentum theorem for rotational motion. It was rotational inertia times the change in angular velocity. This is equal to the torque times the change in time. And you were asked to find the moment of inertia based on all of the other quantities, but you weren't given torque. You know that torque is RF sine theta and you were given R and F and sine theta. You were given all that. Sine theta was just one in mind. So you would need to sort of say that I is equal to RF delta T over delta omega, just based on all of this. And so it's kind of insane, actually, because there is a lot going on. And this is the basis of one of the questions called the experimental design question, which I will get to. So yeah, you will definitely need to get your brain around, you will definitely need to get your brain around deriving formulas. Derive as many as you can. Use the formula chart to just manipulate all sorts of quantities. So like you could link I to you could link forces to simple harmonic motion, to energy, to circular motion, to gravitation. You can do all sorts of things. Try to just link all of the physics concepts, all the units into just a bunch of formulas. Try to combine them all together. But yeah, with that, that is kind of the general tips I have. Um, and let's go ahead. So let's go ahead and get on to like each aspect of the AP exam. So the first thing, the multiple choice, this multiple choice is not really talked a lot about, but here's what I have to say from my experience. The multiple choice is completely conceptual. 
It is completely conceptual. There was like one question that had numbers, but the numbers were subscripts again. Like there was just one question that had numbers throughout the entire free response sec or not free response multiple choice section, and I was kind of con and I was kind of stricken by that. I was kind of struck by that. I saw how much conceptual stuff I needed to know, and thankfully I had brushed up on my qualitative reasoning beforehand, so I knew how to do it, and I had practiced a lot, so I didn't have much trouble. But it was definitely something I was not used to. So one thing I would recommend: practice. The MIT workbook. The MIT workbook is literally your savior. It will have just so many MCQs for each unit. And I think it'll be one of the most pre and one of the most helpful will be the most helpful tool besides this video. It'll be the most helpful tool to you getting a five. Practice that MCQ. It will gar if you perfect the MCQ but do awful on the FRQs, you're guaranteed a passing score. So the MCQ, very important, okay? Very important. But that also means do well in the FRQs. You want that five. You don't want a passing, you want a five. So with that, let's go ahead and move into the FRQs. So the FRQs, there are four sections of the FRQ. There are like four types of FRQs. There's just the short answer. There's the experimental design. There is the qualitative quantitative translation. There's the paragraph argument short answer. And then there's another short answer at the end. So you have five FRQs and 90 minutes. I believe it's, yeah, it's 90 minutes. You have five FRQs, all of this done in 90 minutes. So here's the time breakdown. And the time breakdown is actually in the FRQs itself. The short answer and the paragraph argument short answer and the paragraph of argument short answer one. These four, or these, sorry, these three right here, one, four, and five, these FRQs each take 13 minutes. These experiment, this experimental design and quantitative qualitative translation problems, they take 25 each. So that totals to 89 minutes, and you have one minute just to check your answers, but that's really irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. So here's my breakdown for all the FRQs. The short answer one of them is easy one of them is hard maximize the amount of points you can get on the short answer one so on the easy short answer like for mine right the short answer it was like i believe it was just like a, a projectile being launched in a classroom and then it hit the and it like hit the um hit the ceiling and then it started bouncing back all you had to do was just was just calculate right, the was calculate the height of the classroom and the velocity just before it hits the wall. It was really simple. It was really easy. It was just kinematics. Anyone could do it. So try to maximize your points on the easier one. If you don't do well on the harder one, which I know I did not, it was a simple harmonic motion with two springs. It was so hard. I know I did not do well on it, but I maximized my points on the easy one. I, I breezed through that one, I got all seven points, and I think that really helped me get a five on my AP exam. So, that's my personal tip. Again, just practice those easy short answers, it's just so you can maximize those points. And let's go ahead and move into the experimental design. I think the experimental design is one of the more abstract free response questions, but it's very used throughout the AP. So. Experimental design, it's exactly how it sounds. You have to design an experiment around a certain topic, around a certain problem statement, and you sort of have to use some quantities that you'll experimentally observe to calculate another quantity. And that was actually this situation right here. You were given an unknown object and you had to calculate the rotational inertia by spinning it with a string which was attached to a force sensor. And so you were essentially given the, you were given the radius of the apparatus, just the radius that I was spinning on, the force from the sensor and the change in angular velocity, and of course the change in time. You were given all this stuff and you had to use it to calculate the rotational inertia. So with the experimental design, there are a lot of graphs. Graphs are a big thing. And you'll use those graphs typically to 
cal to find the slope of a line, and that'll give you the rotation. It'll give you, in my case, the rotational inertia. I believe that's how it was on my FRQ. So the experiment to design one. Look through past labs that you've done. And since this year was in person, that'll actually be easy. Well, I think it was in person for most of us. So that was actually pretty easy for different AP students this year to look through labs, see what they've done, see how things worked. And another thing is just to recap on physics concepts in general. Remember what I said about deriving your own formulas? That will come in so handy when you're doing when you're doing these physics experimental design questions. So just go through those labs, look through the materials, look through the physics concepts they were examining, try to link them together, and I think you will be pretty well set to get at least 10 of the 12 points on the experimental design FRQ. Now, let's move on to the next one, the quantitative qualitative translation one. This one's a little bit trickier to understand because there are almost no numbers in the quantitative qualitative translation one. Is it qualitative quantitative? I don't even know. But there are almost no numbers. I think on my qualitative quantitative translation one, there was like a planet here, a planet here, the planets were equal in all their properties, and there was like a satellite here at point P, and you had to calculate the net gravitational force of these planets. And you were not given any, you were not given any numbers. You had to use math, just pure math, and mathematical knowledge and variables to figure out an expression for that net gravitational force. And there was also another part where you had to graph a certain quantity as a function of time, just based on a certain scenario. And you were not given any numbers. You had to figure out what that graph might look like. And another thing on this one, there was another one where it's like, if, this, if some quantity changed, how would this affect another variable? That's very common among not just the qualitative quantitative translation problems, but among all of these, except maybe experimental design. But it's extremely common to see how one quantity changing will affect another, and you will definitely see it on quantitative qualitative translation. I can guarantee that. But if you know how to derive formulas, if you are very aware of how to derive formulas, like if you can tell in this case that there's a gravitational force here and a gravitational force here, thus the net gravitational force is gonna be here. And you can analyze the components of these gravitational forces. You can tell that these Y components cancel, therefore the net gravitational force is gonna be in the X direction, in my case. Then you'll be pretty well set. And if you can also tell how one quantity changes with respect to time, or how one quantity changes with respect to another quantity, then you will be pretty well set on the quantitative qualitative translation problems. Again, this description is pretty vague of the qualitative quantitative translation problem. Just look through some examples. I can guarantee the MIT workbook has one and look through past College Board FRQs. They will help a lot with quantitative qualitative translation, experimental design, short answers, and paragraph argument short an answer, which I will get to. So the paragraph argument short answer, this one is writing oriented. So the paragraph argument short answer, you're given a first part, the first part's pretty easy. Um, the first part is pretty, it's like just, it's just something as a function of time. It's like a small graph. Maybe just like if one thing changes, how will another change? It's not that bad, the first part. The second part, the second part is five or six points of the entire FRQ. Keep in mind, paragraph argument short answer, that's seven points. So the paragraph is the majority of that FRQ. So in the paragraph argument short answer, you might be asked to like rank a quantity or rank some quantities if some scenario were to change. Or you might be also asked like if some quantity, if some extra, if some ex exogenous scenario happens, sorry, I got tripped up on my words. If some exogenous scenario happens, how will that affect the system itself? I think a past college board example was if you like dropped, if you had, you had a spring that was hooked to an object. And if there was another object that fell directly on it, it was like an inelastic collision, how will it affect the amplitude and period of the oscillation? So with paragraph argument short answers, what I found is that they tend to be broken up into at least two things. So in this case, it was, par it was amplitude and period of oscillation. But in my, ca in my case, it was like ranking three quantities. 
So what I would definitely do, organize it. Organize it based on one thing and another thing. Try not to, and definitely try to like build it as well. So have like a fundamental understanding of what each scenario of what each scenario is involving in terms of physics physics concepts. Like in my case, I believe it's conservation of momentum, and in this case, it's obviously conservation of momentum and simple harmonic oscillation. But try to get a grasp of what physics concepts are at play, and then use those physics concepts to start just building up on how this scenario will affect one thing and then another thing and then another thing in my case i rank in my case with the rankings i explained how the first one is the lowest the second one is the in the middle and the third one is the greatest but i believe one of them was tied so yeah pretty much just organize your writing that is what i have to say if you organize your writing then it becomes easier to read and you will pretty much, and you will be in a better shape to get at least four or five of the points on the paragraph argument short answer and, or just the paragraph argument itself you'll probably be able to get those other two points as well but yeah with that if you apply all of those tips you should be in a good condition to get a five but it's not just those tips you have to practice that mit workbook again i'm gonna say it again it's your best friend use that mit workbook please it is going to save you. And also look through those past College Board FRQs. If you look through those past College Board FRQs, you'll get a better understanding of what to expect of all five of these questions. You'll see that this first, you'll see that, um, what, this first um, short answer, you'll see an experimental design, you'll see a qualitative quantitative translation. You can see that actually the experimental design could have two different aspects to it. Paragraph argument, a short answer, and then just another short answer. But with that, that right here, if you apply all those tips, practice, do well on the MC, practice on MC as much as you possibly can, you will be in good condition to get a five, I promise. But yeah, this is my advice to get a five on AP Physics 1. I hope you use it and I hope that you get a five. Good luck and happy testing. Well, not really happy testing, but like testing. You'll get a five, I promise, if you don't sue me. But yeah. That concludes this video. Thank you.